Hello and welcome to our second lesson in our course on basic systematic material selection. In today's lesson, we're going to focus on the Ashby selection methodology. At the end of our previous lesson, we saw the breakdown of the materials data needed at our concept, embodiment, and detail phases within our design process. When designing a physical component, materials data is needed at every step. But with thousands of engineering materials to choose from, is there a logical way to think about this? To do this, we're going to use the Ashby selection methodology, which is introduced in chapter four of Mike Ashby's book, Material Selection and Mechanical Design. This methodology starts after the problem statement for our design has been finalized. Using this, we can translate the design requirements into four categories. The first is the function of the design. What does it do? By function in our case, we often mean the geometry and the load situation of the component we're designing. The loading on a component can generally be decomposed into some combination of axial tension or compression, bending, and torsion. Almost always, one mode dominates. This is so common that the functional name given to the component describes the way it's loaded. Ties carry tensile loads, beams carry bending moments, shafts carry torque, and columns carry compressive loads. Second are the constraints. These are essential conditions that must be met in order for the part to function. Think the material must be electrically conductive or have a maximum service temperature above a specific value. The third are the objectives. What performance are we trying to optimize with our design? These are related to the function of the design, especially in the load bearing component cases. And finally, we have the free design parameter. Since all materials are different, if we truly want to choose between them all equally, we need to have some amount of flexibility in our design. The free design parameter allows us to specify one aspect of our part, say the geometry, which we can change as needed. For example, flexibility in cross-sectional area allows us to choose between materials with different stiffness, but achieve the safe performance. Once we have our material properties and loading conditions, we can move on to our screening and ranking stages. If you watched our material selection using Ashby Charts Innovation course, you're familiar with these terms. First, we screen our engineering materials based on the constraints. Constraints determine which material properties are acceptable or not for a design. Then we rank the materials that are left over based on our objectives, seeing which materials best maximize or minimize our properties of interest their performance. After these steps, we're left with a few top candidate materials. At this point, additional research is needed, such as safety standards, etc., combined with simulation and other design considerations to make the final material decision. So you can see that we have a nice systematic way of going through our various design criteria to get from thousands of engineering materials down to a few top candidates for our consideration. One tricky aspect of this methodology is the translation step, getting from our design problem statement into these key constraints and objectives. So let's go through an example with a selection analogy. This is actually something I dealt with in my personal life last year. I needed a new car. It had been over 10 years since I'd gotten my previous one and my life has changed pretty significantly since. So my needs in my car have changed as well. So the first thing I did was write out a list of requirements, which I've shown here on the screen. My car needed to have four doors. Why? Because I wanted four doors. Sometimes when designing a product, your customer has some requirement that you need to meet, which may not have any technical merit, and that's okay. I also needed to have a hatchback trunk. I'm often carting various things around it. I need a place to put all my stuff. I also, needed to be able to tow a pop-up camper. We don't own one yet, but my husband and I have been talking about purchasing one in the next five-ish years. I know I'll still have my car at that point, so it needs to be able to tow it. I also had some maximum value that I was willing to spend for monthly car payments. And finally, I didn't really care about the car color or the material the interior was made out of. 
how do I take this list and actually come up with a car? Well, I actually can use the selection methodology and break down these requirements into functions, constraints, objectives, and free design parameters. So the function of my car is that it has to be able to transport me, my husband, and our dog on various outdoor camping and hiking trips, as well as long haul drives to see family and friends who live out of state. Our constraints it must have four doors and that hatchback trunk. Now, why are these constraints? Well, if the car doesn't have them, I won't buy it. If we go back to our, when we were defining constraints, we said that they were our go, no go criteria. If the material wasn't able to perform in a certain way or didn't have specific properties, we needed to remove it from consideration. So any car that didn't have four doors or a hatchback trunk was removed from the pool of cars I was willing to consider. Next were my objectives. The first one was related to that tow rating. Now, we were also researching pop-up campers at this time and saw that most of the ones that we liked started at around a thousand pounds. So I actually wanna maximize the tow rating for my car. Well, why is this an objective instead of a constraint? If I already owned the pop-up camper, I would need the car that I'm purchasing to be able to tow the existing camper. If it can't, I won't buy it. Therefore, that would be a constraint. Since this pop-up camper is still a hypothetical purchase, I have a little bit more flexibility with this number. Also, the higher the tow rating, the more options I have for my future purchase. My second objective is trying to minimize my monthly car payment. When doing my research, I actually found that these two objectives contradicted one another. In general, the more money I was willing to spend, the higher the tow rating I got. And finally, my free design parameters were car color and interior material. Well, after some searching, I was able to find a new car as shown on the screen here in this lovely shade of blue. It met all my constraints with the four doors and the hatchback trunk, and it performed well for my objectives. The tow rating is around 1,500 pounds, and the monthly car payment is well within the budget I had set myself. And I can confirm that it successfully hauls my family and all of our stuff wherever we need to go. And with that, we've come to the end of our lesson. We've introduced the Ashby selection methodology and spent some time focusing on the translation step, getting from our problem statement to our key constraints and objectives. In our next lesson, we're going to focus on the screening and ranking steps using the Grant to Edupack software. So stick around and see how we can use ANSYS products to go through these material selection steps. My name is Caitlin Tyler. Thanks so much for joining me, and I'll see you in the next one.